Hello and good afternoon and welcome to the Sociology Staff Room. I'm Katie Tyler and I'm with, with a recognisable face, which is Craig. Actually, might not be a recognisable face so much, maybe more a recognisable voice um, on a lot of the, 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 the videos. First of all, hello and good afternoon. How are you? I'm great, Katie. And you? You are right? <laughs> I'm very good. So we're, we've got you here today to speak to us about methods in context. Mm -hmm. Deep breath. Uh, and I'm sure, like myself, like lots of other teachers, we just really want to know what it's all about. I mean, obviously, you know, it's, as I understand, it's <clears throat> slightly different from sort of regular questions on on exams. And obviously, there are, you know, that sort of ability to sort of analyse as well as apply. And that seems to be the key bit there. But, you know, what is required? What What is it about? Come on, give us a, a sort of crazy of what this methods in context is about and a bit more about it um I, I think sort of kind of when you're trying to explain the methods in context question you have to kind of explain that the big skill that it's testing really is application it, it's a student's ability to put themselves into a specific context in education and how they would conduct a piece of research using a specific method so um, a lot of the methods that they, uh, sorry, a lot of the, the, the questions um, that they use are based on um, what we would see as being research scenarios that sociologists might go and investigate. So they tend to look at the context of education and they say, right, okay, let's use a specific method to go and look at that. So really what this skill is testing is it's testing a student's ability to think like a sociologist who is going to conduct some research. And different exam boards sort of like do application in different ways. So for example, OCR, they, they don't do the methods in context, but what they do is they will have pictures and you have to apply your knowledge of a certain, um, a certain skill or a certain topic area to that picture. Um, whereas with AQA, um, it is all based on, you know, the big skill in there is application and applying your understanding of research methods to a specific context in education. Who are you going to research? Um, what is the topic that you're researching? And what kind of characteristics might there be um, related to that topic? And how are you going to conduct the research? They're the three big things it's asking students to do. So that's the, the what, who, and then obviously the, the topic mm. and what they would do in the, the, their study. And, and the skill they're really, really assessing is that application on, on whether, it is, yeah. yes, you might know that, you might know that bit of, methodsy bit but then how does that then mm. link to that context so that's that's really the skill they're doing and yes you might know about mm. i know life documents for argument's sake but you also might know a mm -hmm. about obviously a differential uh, achievement in regards to maybe mm -hmm. gender but then how do you then link them two together is, is that my right and understanding of that so then what are the pitfalls that's then because obviously this is like the hot i don't know i don't want to label it but one of the most challenging questions um in that and i what are some of the pitfalls in, in sort of addressing this question then what do what might mistakes that some students make or or even teachers in in, in that i i think um the main mistake that students will make is they will see the research method and they will talk through the strengths and limitations of that research method um but not really apply it to the context so if we think about um you know, if we think about a question that, that, that came up before, I think back in 2017, it was field experiments mm -hmm. and um, uh, impact on labeling. So what students may do is they may write an essay that will talk about the positives and negatives or the strengths and limitations of field experiments. So they might talk about sort of like some of the ethical issues you would have with a field experiment. They may talk about sort of like how field experiments, um, you know, how you can manipulate you know, a variable within that. They may talk about those type of things, but then not apply it to the context of education or that specific context of labeling. So they don't really apply it to some of the problems that you might have conducting a field experiment in a school, for example, or a field experiment with pupils. So they don't consider sort of like some of the differences you may, you know, some of the problems you may encounter when you're researching a pupil. Um, and they also don't, you know, I think it was linked to labeling and pupil achievement. I think the question was, mm. they don't then link it into how it might impact on, on, on achievement and, and, and the actual topic area that's being um, investigated. 
So that's one of the big pitfalls. The other kind of pitfall is that students kind of identify a study that's very similar. So the, the one we just described, Rosenthal and Jacobson, mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's quite clearly based on Rosenthal and Jacobson's uh, Pygmalion in the classroom. What they may then do is give quite long descriptions of that study. They may think about, well, when Rosenthal and Jacobson did this, this is what they did, this is what they found. And that's not really answering the question. What it's doing is it's showing their knowledge of a piece of research, not showing how they can apply their knowledge of research to a specific situation. So they're the two kind of ways that students tend to go wrong on it. So then how do we resolve that? Like, obviously, is there any sort of tips that we could get? So obviously, the two pitfalls are that either students talk about the methodology and don't put it into the context, mm -hmm. or they might talk about the study, per se, like, mm -hmm. and just describe that. So they're basically focusing on mm -hmm. AO1, knowledge and understanding, versus the, the application element. So then how does, mm -hmm. as, as teachers, first of all, can we help to prepare or teach uh, this to our students because obviously there's so many uh, when you sort of think about it, there's so many different scenarios aren't there that could be put in that obviously mm -hmm. in a classroom we can't physically look at every single type of scenario that we could be made up because obviously but there are or is there do you know what I mean like obviously you've got all the different methodologies but I was thinking of all the different combinations that they could be and also mm -hmm. the groups of people is there a way of doing because obviously a, a sort of yeah what is it? What, what, what do we do? How do you do so it? Much? Yeah, and also um, time constraints, because obviously we've got mm. the education, you've got methods and whatever your option topic, for example, if it's family or cultural identity, that, and then you go to the methods and context. And some of teachers like to teach some of the year 13 material. You know, how do we mm. do that not only effectively, but also succinctly as well? Um, there's a number of different ways you can do it succinctly. I mean, I think I've spoken before about how I do research methods first. Uh, I do it before I do education. Um, I will start with paper one, then paper two, then paper three. Um, and what I will do, sort of like when I'm doing the research methods, I will start to introduce some of these pieces of research that we may then look at in education. So, for example, if I was doing a lesson on official statistics, I might use official statistics in education and then start to ask students about what might be the problems with investigating official statistics and pupil achievement. This is kind of doing two things. One, it's putting that methods in context idea into their heads, but also two, it's covering the first part of differential educational achievement. So that one lesson that you might use to cover the differences by gender, by social class, by ethnicity, well, you're doing that with official statistics. You're doing that with your research methods. So it's trimming your content down a little bit. What you might do is you might sort of like say, right, okay, well, Here's some official statistics. Um, here's, here's the, the achievement data for uh, 2021 or 2022. Um, what trends might we notice in here? Let's have a look and see what we can do. And students should be able to sort of say, right, okay, well, it tells us why. It tells, it tells us what has happened. It tells us what groups overachieve, what groups underachieve, um, which genders overachieve and underachieve. It tells us that free school meal kids underachieve. It doesn't tell us why. And there we're starting already to put in this idea of methods in context. Of course, something like official statistics, there's only kind of limited topic areas really that you can use with official statistics. You know, you're not gonna get asked uh, a question on using official statistics to look at gender identity, for example, because gender identity is very much a, a qualitative um, topic area. So some of these, so things like university destinations maybe, um, you know, that might be something in terms of official statistics that, that, that you look at and you bring those in as you're doing your research method. The course that we did recently for Tutor to You where we, we, we did some of this is we started to use some questionnaires that were already in education. So a good one to use was um, Alice Sullivan's cultural capital questionnaire. And students don't need to know about cultural capital at this point, but when they're looking at that questionnaire, you're starting to introduce ideas that right it's very difficult to operationalize cultural capital so you're putting those hints in ahead of time you can then also do that when you're doing education so you can reinforce these ideas so th there's a kind of idea of foreshadowing what we're going to do and then revisiting what we've already done so as you go through the specification there are some studies that really stand out 
where you can have a really good go at unpicking the methods and the problems that that researcher may have had conducting that research. Um, one of the first ones I always go to is Paul Willis, um, you know, because in many ways, Willis is the first kind of probably, if you, if you do Willis at the end of theory, and lots of people do use Willis as kind of a, a, a to counteract some of the Marxist views, you know, and sort of say that well, students aren't passive. You can look at the methods that Willis used and you can start to ask students, well, what issues might he have had conducting that research? You know, he's in a group of small, you know, he's in a small group of boys. How might he have accessed them? What, you know, what, what about status differences? They will know some of this from doing the research methods already but you're getting them thinking about the problems that may occur. And as you go through that course, pretty much for most of those specification points, there are pieces of research that you could use. Um, I say sort of like the theory ones like Durkheim and Parsons, probably not. <laughs> but, you know, when you look at the likes of Louise Archer and using group interviews and unstructured interviews, um, you look at, as I said, Alice Sullivan and questionnaires, you look at Ball looking at observations, um look at ball Bowitz and go uh, sorry go it's ball and bow oh, yeah <laughs> yeah whichever way around it was um <laughs> and the use of um secondary sources um school uh, you know school prospectuses um some of the studies that look at gender and subject images obviously are used in secondary sources as well um i think it's delamont who looked at the the school books and sort of like um and I think Spender as well. All of those bits of research, you can kind of start to embed this idea that, well, these are some of the issues that sociologists face. And that's one way in which you can do it in a very timely way, because you're still focused on the topic, but you're just introducing a little bit extra in. So rather than saying, this is a study, this explains this, take the, take the study, take half an hour in a lesson, and sort of like say, right, how can we analyze this study? You know, what problems might the researcher have faced? How might, say, for example, if we look at, um, say, you look at Archer's study into Nike identities, how might the students have responded to Archer, who, you know, is essentially a white middle class woman, and you've got working class boys, how are they going to respond? What might be the differences in that piece of research? What might the researcher have had to do? Um, was she using the right method to get them to really open up about their identity formation? So there's lots of different things you can do um, within the curriculum and how we embed it. So really sort of embedding it, it's what sort of, sort of embedding it basically is what I took away from that. So like rather than sort mm. of teach methods separately from education, actually it's interweaving it. So it makes sense. It's that revisiting use, it. Yeah, yeah. yeah interweaving it's revisiting. Revisit, rather than looking at methods I mean, not to say you don't look at other methods because obviously you, you could do, but it makes sense mm. to look at methods that link to education rather than sort of maybe look at other ones for argument's sake. Well, I, mm. I know that you potentially will look at that whether you look at crime and obviously stratification, but there won't be an explicit question on the methodologies in that same way as they are for methods in context of not, education. No, not anymore. Old no. spec there was, wasn't there? Yeah. Old spec. So, if you depended on whether you did health or education, you could have had a health methods in context question. And on mm. paper, on what was the old paper four, you used to get a crime and deviance methods in context mm. question. But fortunately, we don't have that anymore. Yeah. And but then obviously, you could still use it, I suppose, for the methods question that is on on paper three, that was, you know, or, or paper one, where mm. there's a sort of general one where you can apply anything. It's not particular to education. But the question then is to mm. you, what about those teachers like the start, we've already started, we're, we're now in November, you know, some of us have started mm. on education or maybe started with the options unit first. Um, is, is because obviously that's the suggestion that we're sort of now sitting in se if September we could potentially do that. What could we do, would it be like when we did come across the method section that we, then incorporate the education methods then, um, rather, because obviously a lot of people would have taught methods maybe in sort of the Easter term maybe, or, or after Christmas mm. or something. You can, you, as I say, you can do it, you can do it either way. You can either do it in with the education or mm. you can put the education into the research methods and use, use some examples of education that you've already done um, when you're looking at research methods. So it might be, 
again, you come to do um, something on group interviews, for example, and you might sort of like start to say, right, okay, well, where have we come across group interviews before? Okay, well, Paul Willis used some group interviews. What issues might he have had? And that then you're then starting to illustrate um, students applying their knowledge of that topic, of those students, those specific students, to that research, those research findings, sorry, sorry, to that research method. So you can do it either way. The other way you can, I mean, I always revisit it throughout the course, but I also do specific revision on methods and context. So when That's you do your next exam question skills. Is, yeah, how, yeah, how do we revise? Because you talked about the teaching bit. Obviously, it makes sense to use methods that are linked to, to education. Um, but then, yes, the revision. How, how do we go about revising for that? <laughs> I, I think you revise it in... in in, in, a, in quite a similar way to sort of like you would revise other topics. But what you're really focusing on when you're doing your revision is getting students to consider the type of people who may come up in that question, the type of people who may be um, researched within that question. So you need to think about the research characteristics of pupils, of parents, and of teachers in schools, uh, you know, head teachers. So how might those, what you might do, I mean, I, I had um, a, a handout, I, I did it, well, it must be about four years ago now, 2019, where I would put the teacher in the middle, put a picture of the teacher in the middle and say, right, okay, how might a teacher react to different research methods? So how might a teacher react to going into an unstructured interview? Well, we know that a teacher probably has a similar status to a researcher, so there may be less differences, but, um, we may also find that teachers will put forward a very professional image. So are they really giving us a true reflection of what happens in the classroom when they sit down and talk to a researcher? Likewise, you think about teachers and observations and you say, right, okay, well, how are teachers gonna react when an observer comes into the classroom? And of course, we're doing the sociology staff room thing and many teachers will have been observed and you will be able to sort of like develop that point. Will teachers put on a show? You know, teachers probably aren't going to be at the most natural when somebody else is in their classroom. And these are some of the things that, that students need to know. You can do the same with pupils. If mm -hmm. pupils are in a group interview setting, are they going to kind of conform to the views of one or two people who are more dominant in that group? And these are some of the things that students need to get into their response. Then you can look at some other topics. You know, you look at some of the topic areas and you could identify which topic areas might be sensitive. So, for example, things like your, the formation of your gender identity. Is, is that a sensitive topic? And if so, um, you know, what methods might be best to use that? So it's about looking at the method. It's also about looking at the people who take part and the topic itself. So I ideally sort of just get them to, to kind of mind map some of those ideas and um, try and link them together. I have seen lots of different um, activities. Some people will get students to throw darts at a dartboard to pick a method and to pick a, an issue and then try and make the links, which, which is a nice one. Um, there might be some problems with that because you might get mm -hmm. some that just really aren't going to come up. You know, sort of like there's something like, um, as I said before, official statistics on gender identity. You're not going to get that to come up. Um, so that would be one way in which you which you can revise it and get students to think about the characteristics of those who are being researched and the topics themselves. So a lot of different techniques, really. It's really getting the students to think outside the box a little bit rather mm. than sort of, and like you said, putting themselves into that shoe of, of the researcher. And like, it's been sort of quite, like, mm. you've got quite a lively group, maybe a bit of role play there would be quite good, sort of getting them to be those you, people, yeah. potentially. Um, you can do, um, you can do sort of like, um, I think on one of the one of the courses, I sort of like said, look, I'm, I'm very aware that not all students will go and role play, but there was an activity uh, in, in the research method thing where I said, it'd be really good to role play it. I know a few people have used balloons um and sort of like drawn the characteristics of different characters onto the of, of different people onto the balloons that's one way of doing it um you can as i say sort of like just basically put down a template of a female student and sort of like say right okay what do we know about female students well we know they achieve highly and we know that they might be subjected to sexual harassment in schools we know that they may be subjected to sexist views we know that um, they have um, better reading skills than boys. 
thinking about all of those characteristics that you've learned in education and then thinking well what advantages might we have or disadvantages might we have with with dealing with those issues so for example if you talk about gender differences um in literacy levels or something like that we we, we know that girls perform better so if we're using a piece of research that maybe is based upon literacy then that would have put girls at an advantage if you see mm. what i mean i always remember sort of like a student coming out and there was a quite there was a question on um there was a question on uh, literacy levels of of parents via a written questionnaire and a student came out and sort of said oh it's just a nonsense question because you know parents with low levels of literacy might not be able to read the questionnaire and i was like that's kind of the point that's one of your limitations that you've got in there. Um, another way of, of, of revision, of revising it, I, I think as well, is picking picking the item apart. Yeah, the item has a lot of clues in it, doesn't it? A lot of hooks in there. Lots, lots, lots of clues. Some people mistakenly think that the item is the context, right? But the item is there to sh so that you can apply your knowledge to it. And I would say most items, there are, there are six or seven big clues your first paragraph is all about the 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 issue that you're investigating and the second paragraph always gives hints about some of the strengths and limitations of the method themselves and as a nice little starter activity you can quite simply put a past paper question up and say right i'm going to give you 10 minutes to try and find all the clues and develop those points um just to get students to sort of like be used to using that item because I actually think it's it, it's it's the most thorough item on the entire paper. It's I the best totally item agree. to use. I mean, it's the best item you've got, really, because you sort of it's mm. you basically it's your maybe your the student's first, second, and third and fourth paragraph there, and it's just mm. developing those those things. If there's time, would you get students to do? Because that's something I've done in the past. Um, obviously, not doing the pandemic because obviously not literally possible um unless they were looking obviously at, at official statistics but carrying out a bit of like action research within their school is that something that would help because obviously then they get to interviews or carry out observations obviously get consent from or potentially not i mean that's straight away a limitation their teacher said well actually no this is not possible that's what i suppose they okay it doesn't get very far but certainly. Like, yeah certainly you would do that within research methods and then that helps you applying those skills to methods in context um I, I don't think I think it's one of those where it's you, you, you can do it and if you have the time to do that research to do that action research is a fantastic thing because students then learn firsthand what some of the strengths and limitations are. They learn that there are problems with writing a questionnaire to, to, to write a very you know a questionnaire that that measures what it's supposed to measure. There are problems with doing interviews and um, that interviews are quite difficult and you need to be quite skilled to do an unstructured interview but it's you know, how do we get access to do an observation? What teacher is going to let them go and observe a classroom? So, you know, that, so it's really useful if you've got the time um, available to do that. And that's why I say with research methods, it's very much, it's a lot better to do it hands on because students get an idea of some of those issues that they may face. Yeah, definitely. I think that's, a lot of it is a lot, like I said, it's restriction of time. I know with it, when there was, go back, you're only talking historically, when there was a coursework option in it, I think, well, not option, it was part of the, the exam, that I think students really understood the research methods, but also know that appreciate that time limitations aren't always, a, it might not be always possible. And I know that lots of schools wouldn't have done it because of, of the mm. pandemic, so um, not always mm. not always viable. Um, in regards to sort of the, the sort of whole methods in context, is there anything sort of final points, any final top tips? So we've talked about, you know, making sure that you apply it to the context, not just talking about the method or the study that might link. You've spoken about putting yourself in the shoes of the researcher, look at the characteristics, look at the possible options. If you've got, a, if you can interweave it um, or embed it into education and vice versa into methods and having that sort of correlation rather than going off piece and looking at sort of being sort of I suppose smart with your choices of, of methods that you look at and case studies yeah. mainly because of exam restrictions potentially because of time um mm -hmm. are there any sort of final top tips you think you know because a lot of us have been taught for a long time but also some of us haven't and we're always learning aren't we we're always improving are there any sort of final top tips with yeah. your expertise of methods in context Practice, practice writing responses. Say quite seriously, pra practice writing responses because what happens is you might pick out an idea and develop it, but you 
Uh, you might pick out an idea and think, right, okay, that's that's a that's a limitation. But then you don't always um, don't always have uh, ha have the have the the structure of a sentence in order to do it. One way I used to do it, and and you can see this on the um, the free methods and context lessons that we did during the pandemic um, on Tutor to You, is I layer get students to layer the answers. So what I might do is I might give them the first line of a response. So it might be something like um, a limitation of using group interviews um, is that one person may dominate the conversation. And then, so I've given them a limitation of a group interview. Now I want them to add in a feature of pupils. And then I want them to add in a feature of the research itself. So if we take a look at last year's kind of question where you looked at group interviews and subject choice, you've got that first line there, sort of like saying the limitation of group interviews is that one figure may be dominant. Well, we know that we're studying pupils. Okay, so we could sort of like say that, you know, the pupils who are being studied, um, you know, they, there may be one or two pupils, uh, sorry, there may be one or two pupils who are more dominant what else we know about pupils and we link it to subject choices that gendered subject choices boys and girls so we know that boys might be more dominant in that discussion now we've got to think about subject choice well would boys like to talk about subject choice in front of other boys and we know we can link in so you know we, we, we our, our knowledge of sociology tells us that boys aren't going to or boys will not pick what are seen as being feminine subjects because they're afraid of um, their peers ridiculing them. And so there, from that one little sentence we started off with, we've moved from what would be essentially a methods-based answer to an answer that is very much in the context. And you can do that with, with many, uh, you can do that with many others. What I would always suggest is start with the method, a strength or limitation of the method, and then apply that those who have been studied, characteristics of those who have been studied, and then apply it to that issue, or you could do it vice versa and play the issue, and then and then the people. So you're making sure you're hitting all those points, basically. Um, yeah. So that rules you're thinking. Off, hmm. You're thinking about it. You've got to mention in those paragraphs. You've got to mention a characteristic of who you are researching, something very specific to uh, the group you are researching. You've got to mention something specific about the issue that you are researching, and you have to mention something a specific strength or limitation of the method the how so it's the who what and the how are the three that we kind of that, that, that we're focusing on and as teachers when you're marking those you know your good responses will hit the who the what and the how um consistently they will they will they will be the ones that you look at and go right okay they are that's a top band answer because the student is consistently talking about who they are who who is taking part in the research and a specific characteristic of them. So, for example, um, if you're talking about working class kids, it might be that the, 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 the characteristic might be that they're more prone to anti-school behaviours, for example. You're talking about an issue. So we might be talking about something like, say, setting and streaming. Mention something specific about setting and streaming, maybe the psychological impacts of setting and streaming, maybe the way in which setting and streaming polarises different groups and how this might be sensitive for some people. Some people may um react negatively to, to setting a stream in they may take on an anti anti-education stance and then that might have an impact on um your interactions with a researcher doing those doing those things and practicing those things is, is, is a really good way of, of pulling it all together and it's quite a short thing to do you know you can you know you can do one or two of these at the start of each of your kind of revision, revision lessons if you're doing a paper one revision lesson, you could take maybe three points from an exam question, write down the first line, and then ask students who, the what and how. In, two, in two or three minutes, add in the who, add in the what, add in, you know, add in, yeah. And the thing as well is I think the students could also do themselves, like in the sense of looking at like their essays, as you said, about the teacher marking, but actually they mm. could have three kind of highlighters and go, where's the mm. who, the how and the what, do you know what I mean? So it's very, it's an old, quite, there was an old activity that we used to do. I can't remember if it was on WOW or if it was on one of the essential sociology courses that we did, where we did an activity called backwards sociology and it was with the MIC questions. And what we would do is we'd have a number of paragraphs and then we would get students to identify um, 
a characteristic, um, a characteristic of, of a pupil or parent or teacher. Um, have we mentioned the um, the topic? And have we mentioned the method? And then they would kind of score each paragraph mm. as to whether it hit one, two, or three of those. So that's another way you can do it. Get some model answers. Get some answers back. Certainly, I would I would recommend getting answers back from your students. If you're going to get answers back from from any paper, look at um, question one because it is it's written very very differently to um, to to a normal essay. I would say. Oh, definitely. I just on on that. I think we've said some really sort of nice gems of information there. I know another activity I've seen in the past. Again, I, I don't know who I'm credited on this. Whether it is actually sociology or, or psychology, but where it's if you can change the the context, it still reads the same. I think it's like mm. the traffic warden or something like that. Um, that was sociology. Not, yeah. Yeah. Then obviously it's that one. That one. It's to. I think. I think I heard, I heard that one. That, that one's been around for quite a while. It's been about, you know, certainly when I started teaching, that was around. I think one of the very first AQA training sessions I went to, the the instructor at the time was talking about traffic light uh, traffic light test. The idea is is that if you substitute the person that you were talking about, so if you if you substitute, say for example, um, a working class boy for a traffic warden, and the sentence still makes sense then you're not referring to the characteristics of, of that student, you know, of a student. Yeah, and I think that's a really sort that of quite easy one for the student to think about, isn't it? That when they read it back mm. themselves, that's almost like a little question they ask themselves, like before they hand it in, you know, does it still make sense if you put it, like I always say, underwater basket mm. weaving, I don't know why, but I don't know, yeah. does it still make sense? And yeah. then if it does, then obviously not. You can, you can use anything for it. I mean, so like I used, because I was in a school in, um, because obviously it's not like I was in a college in Liverpool, I always used to sort of like say the your mum rule. So if you put your, your mum in instead, um, does it make sense? And of course that that gets a bit of, you know, particularly in Liverpool, sort of like where you go, your ma, you know, um, it, it kind of just brings up a little bit of humour, but sort of like people are putting answers in your ma, and it doesn't make sense. Your ma does this, your ma does that. <laughs> but it got them to remember it. It got them to remember it a little bit, so that's cool oh thank you for your time lots to think about there and like you said it is different slightly different question to sort of your other sort of questions and i think it's it's going mm. back to what you originally said which is about that application so lots to think about lots to sort of keep us on our toes as, as teachers and obviously the students of sociology as well so thank you for your time and um no as problem. always you know keep on doing what you're doing it's it's great thank you great <laughs> no problem thanks katie that's all right take care bye bye